So, um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce maybe one of the most illustrious panels I've ever participated on. Uh, <laughs> All right, I can commit to it. Definitely the most illustrious panel I've ever participated on, because it was... <laughs> Because it was, it was all my idea. Um, <laughs> uh, but first, and I'll, I'll introduce myself as part of that as well, um, so that we don't need to get the board over, overtaxed again with emceeing. Um, but first, what I want to do is actually read a statement um, that my colleagues and, and I, including Mark from Aorta, who's floating around somewhere, and Autumn here, who I'll introduce in a moment from Aorta, um, composed earlier this week, the day after the U.S. election. Um, so I'm going to read that, and then we'll dive into the real business. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. Our movements for justice have taken a terrible blow this week. Donald Trump ran a campaign rooted in and relying upon white supremacy, misogyny, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia, and one. Exit polls show 58% of white voters ranging across class, educational background, and gender elected Trump. Several decades of neoliberal economic policies have failed the vast majority of this, of this nation's residents, and the Trump campaign capitalized on this dissatisfaction by supposedly offering something different. We grieve the harm that has already been wrought by this vicious campaign and the further harm that will come through newly embodied channels of violence directed at immigrants, Muslims, women, queer, trans, and gender nonconforming people, indigenous communities, all people of color, and the land that we share. As we reckon with the reality that has been exposed, we find strength in the fact that together we are far more powerful than the presidency. We, we know that justice is not and never has been found in the election of a US president. Trump's victory is not our movement's defeat. Our movements are independent, resilient, responsive, and necessary. Grassroots in a way no presidential campaign can ever be. As many have said, the outcome of this election is a violent backlash against our movement's successes. Our movements are powerful. The terrain just shifted considerably, and we'll need to adapt our organizing, advocacy, education, research, healing, and cultural work strategies as we understand the new conditions that we face. We will need to engage in both agitation and compassion. Many of us will be moving forward with organizing while processing our own personal and community traumas. A man who has been accused of rape and sexual assault multiple times, who has promised mass deportations, vilified Muslims, vowed to strip those of us with uteruses of reproductive rights, positioned himself as the law and order candidate poised to undermine black freedom struggles and made his disdain for women, elders, disabled people, and queer people blatantly clear has just been elected to our nation's highest office. It is necessary that we care for each other in this time, that we remain rooted in love for each other and for our collective liberation as we resist and challenge the brutal core of white supremacy and hatred that has been made plain by this election. We are with you, the brave many, committed to continued struggle. Please be in touch if there's any ways that Aorta can support or plug into the good work that you are doing. Empower the Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance. And now, we have a plenary where we actually are talking about black liberation. And we're talking about cooperatives. And we're talking about reparations. And um, so I I'm actually gonna be moderating this 
discussion, although I don't know that it needs much moderation. I'm really just gonna kinda get it kicked off and try to keep us on time. Um, and maybe interject some juicy questions every once in a while. Um, so who am I? My name's Esteban Kelly, and I'm the executive director for the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. I also am a co-founder of Aorta and a worker owner there. And um, I'm a former board member of NASCO and an inductee into NASCO's Co-op Hall of Fame. So that's a little bit of who I am. I, I live in Philadelphia. It's a great place. Um, and I'm joined here by, I'll go from far to near, Autumn Brown who lives in Minnesota, and yeah, um, and is one of the newest <laughs> members and trainers in Aorta. Um, Autumn has also been an organizer for a really long time, um, including those of you who've been exposed first or early to consensus process um, through the Occupy movement. Uh, Autumn was actually involved in training a lot of people through the Brecht Forum um, for about a year, year and a half, something like that, two years prior to Occupy. And so she was going around training people in consensus process all around New York City in a grassroots way, and then Occupy happened. And so a lot of the consensus process that was used there actually is like tied back to this woman here on my far left. Um, okay, then we have, how do I even, then we have Dr. Jessica gordon Demhard, who is a professor at John Jay College, yes. Uh, as we learned last night, she's been involved in the co-op movement for 60 years. Uh, she, some of you who left earlier are like, oh, damn, I didn't know that. Um, well, we all learned this last night when you were skipping out on the banquet. Um, uh, Jessica is an activist scholar, passionately so, um, has done a lot of research um, and published a very important book about the history of African-American cooperative organizing. Um, and resilience and resistance and movements here in, in the United States called Collective Courage. Um, and is now doing a lot of research on cooperatives in, among incarcerated people, so people in prison. Um, Jessica happens to, I was sad that this wasn't mentioned last night, but she happens to be one of the most recent inductees um, into the National Co-op Hall of Fame. Yes. Um, so we're lucky to have two people um, among us and in this community who have that distinction. Jim Jones was also inducted about five or six years ago. Um, and yes. And then last but not least, you all know my friend Ed. Uh, Ed Whitfield has been an, an, an organizer and a resident um, in the Southeast US in several different states. He now um, is embedded in North Carolina, but continues to organize throughout the South, and of course linking up with partners nationally. Um, he's a board member at a lot of important uh, cooperative development organizations, including the Working World, and is of course the um, co-managing director for the Fund of Democratic Communities. He also, you may have realized, was the 2016 keynote for the National, for NASCO's Cooperative Education <laughs> and Training <laughs> Institute. So this is who we are. And the theme this year um, is about cooperative resilience. So I actually wanted to start with a little disruptive question um, to Autumn. Um, because I have heard you talk a little bit, but not really at length, about how your decades in the nonprofit world have made you a little bit um, allergic to the term resilience. <laughs> and <laughs> um, and so with that in mind, I actually um, wrote the description about this session in a way that didn't lift up resilience as a primary thing. But I also realized my analysis is a little thin. I, I don't have that same reaction. So I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about why resilience, especially when it's applied to communities of color and low-income communities, um, is a problematic term. Sure. Hi. Um, yeah, and so I, I guess I should, I mean, I want to out myself as someone who is sort of a recovering nonprofit professional. 
And, you know, I spent, before joining Aorta, I spent like the previous five years serving as an executive director of two different nonprofits. And before that, I had worked in a lot of different roles in nonprofits. And um, for me, a huge part of the problem with the terminology of resilience as applied to the issues that we're facing is that it's, um, just more of the masking language that we continue to see from those who are in power or who have access to the types of resources that we actually need in order to make significant change. But they'll only give us those resources or only allow us to utilize those resources if we put our work in their framework, right? And resilience is their framework. Resilience is their framework of Right, we are going to kick you down the stairs and we just want to see if you can get back up. Are you able to get back up on your own? Oh, you got back up? We're going to kick you down another flight of stairs and see if you can get back up again. <laughs> so to me, that's sort of, I feel like the, the frame of resilience, I, I particularly hear it a lot, advanced a lot from the philanthropic arm of the nonprofit sector um, as they really want to see this it's sort of paired often with the terminology of sustainability, which they mean in a very different way than I think what we're often talking about when we're talking about sustainability. You know, they want to do initial investment in the type of work that might result in some change, and then they want us to figure out a way to resource it ourselves, even though we started from a place of having it resourced by the folks who are causing a lot of these issues. Um, and so for me, I think it's, I, I think of resilience in and of itself is not a problematic idea. Resilience is something that we know. Resilience is something that we have. Resilience is something that we are, right? I am resilient. I've experienced an enormous amount of trauma in my life and I am a resilient individual and I'm part of a practice of resilience. For me, the problem really has to do with that frame being enforced upon me as though it doesn't already describe my reality. You know what I'm saying? Like, my reality is already that we are in resilience what we need is <laughs> redistribution. What we need is reparations. What we need is, what we need is community control. You know what I mean? So for me, for me it's like, uh, it really is about, I don't wanna talk about resilience if we aren't actually talking about the mechanisms of power and the ways in which those need to be redistributed amongst us. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, I and it, and it does sound like that, that, that it is an important distinction when we talk about cooperative resilience. In a lot of ways, cooperative resilience is inherently, it's already cutting out the nonprofit philanthropic thing because it's about doing for ourselves. Um, I wanna back it up. So when we talk about some of those things you just mentioned about what we need, um, I, it seems to me like a lot of resistance, particularly among uh, white people, is, a, is around a disconnect and not understanding what it is that we've been through because part of the project of white supremacy has been about around erasure. Um, and I know that in one of the sessions um, that we were in, that I was facilitating on Friday, we spent some time in Jessica's book, we had little study sessions, um, and in one of them it talked um, a little more in depth about the, um, the economic sabotage on black cooperative projects that accompanied so much of the late 19th and early 20th century, um, actual burning down of cooperative businesses, vandalizing of them, um, and lynching uh, of leaders. So um, I'm wondering, both for Jessica and Ed, like what are some of the things um, that are important to lift up as a precondition? I mean, you mentioned education, a lack of education and awareness yesterday, Ed. Um, what are some of those things as a precondition that are important to lift up and, um, and make especially white people aware of, of what it is that we have endured and survived, what it is that has been taking away, taken away from us, um, even when some of that is pretty damn obvious, like our labor was stolen for hundreds of years, um, that people profited off of it, built, continued to build their, their own wealth, and le left us behind, for example. So I'm wondering what are some of the things that you would say um, in a conversation about, uh, a, a pre-conversation, um, before even mentioning reparations? What are the conditions? Why is it needed? Okay. You should have made it more 
Esteban should have told us who should go first, but anyway, I'll go first because I also want to make sure we acknowledge the original occupants of the land. I believe it's the Hurons and some other First Nation groups. Thanks, I forget, somebody help me. But especially if we're talking about reparations, we have to talk about um, asset stripping and genocide and that kind of thing. So I want to make sure we do that acknowledgement first. And I also do want to explain the 60 years in co-ops. <laughs> I was born into uh, an intentional cooperative community. So um, it wasn't actually voluntary. So if I have to say voluntary, then I was probably 18 or 20. Um, so, but I was, I lived, I grew up in a, a co-op community. So anyway, that's my justification for the 60 years. I am 60 years old, however, so if you're worried that where the years go, they're <laughs> here. <laughs> um, one of the ways that, well, first of all, I named the book Collective Courage because, as Esteban already started to say, I realized when I went through this history of African American, can you all hear me? Is this, okay. Of African American cooperative ownership that a lot of the history was this collective courage because it turned out to be very dangerous to practice alternative economics especially um, under white supremacist violence. And I was going to say especially in the South, but to tell you the honest truth, it's not just the South. It was all over the United States. And sometimes it was just, just financial sabotage, but often it was actual physical sabotage, murder, and terrorism. And so I wanted to make sure that, that the, the title of the book conveyed um, all that we had to go through because the other problem was and I think this is the first sentence of the book, but I can't really remember exactly how it goes. But I also said that the history was not, is the, there's a long and strong history, but it was hidden. And if it was told, it was told as a history of failure. And that's where I want to get to it, because the failure was because of all the sabotage. But when the history got told, if it got told at all, the sabotage wasn't mentioned either because people were too fearful to talk about it or because that's, you know, the operation, the operator game, you know, where by the time it gets to the last person, the words are all different from what it was when you first said it. So it's either the translation by the time it gets to the next generation, the word failure is the only thing that anybody understood and so they left it at that or it was too scary to talk about all the sabotage. So the story gets told as failure when actually most of the disappointments were because of sabotage and or because of miseducation and um, miscommunication kind of issues. And so I did try not to really talk so much about failure in the book because I didn't want to perpetuate that mythology. But I did talk about the sabotage as much as I could at the same time of lifting up the survival, the ways that, they, that the co-op efforts still benefited community, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think it's really important for us, especially when we get to reparations, is to remember it's not just that they stole our bodies and our work and our wealth from us and gave us nothing. It's not just that even after they changed the laws, they still didn't let us have equality or equality of opportunity or equality of outcome or any of that stuff, but it's also even when we tried to do our own stuff, they stopped, hindered, killed us, hurt us, et cetera. And so it's a whole package, right? And one of the reasons why it's important to talk about the whole package is because people try to get nitpicky, right? Oh, it wasn't my ancestors. Oh, it wasn't then. Oh, I wasn't in that state or whatever, right? But it's the whole package. It's the whole system. It's all of us are complicit in some way or another because we're in this system and in some ways we benefited from it. So we need to understand all the details of that package. And I don't know if you want me to go through some of the details of sabotage or if you just want the general theory that this is why I think we Tell have some claims. details. Um, details. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the 1880s, which was one of the prolific periods of African-American co-ops, it was also a prolific period of co-ops in the labor movement, which a lot of people don't realize. Um, the Knights of Labor, the Cooperative Workers Union, and the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union all were heavily sabotaged. In fact, all the leaders had to go underground, had to live underground, had to carry guns in order to protect themselves. And one of the worst massacres against a co-op was in Mississippi. Um, 
in a small town in Mississippi, the uh, Cooperative Alliance actually didn't even have their own co-op store. They were using the white co-op store in the neighboring town because they couldn't actually organize and they realized they might as well if the whites would allow them. Um, and some of the whites didn't want them to use the co-op store, but they shared the co-op store with the whites. Well, one, uh, I think it was 1886, um, there was a question about one of the leaders of the, the, the Colored Farmers Alliance and Cooperative Union, and the whites accused him of embezzling the money. Luckily, his fellow members, co-op members, didn't believe it, but they realized that the whites were setting him up to either be lynched or thrown out of town or whatever, and so they rallied against him. The whites call in posses from all the neighboring towns and they get the state militia to come and they end up massacring probably about 100 people, but there's no, all the records have different numbers from 25 to 100. Most of them are co-op members. The co-op also ran a newspaper, their own newspaper. They forced the newspaper to stop printing. They broke the printing press, they massacred the people, and they made it illegal for the white co-op store in the neighboring town to serve black members. And so they basically um, destroyed the whole uh, co-op association that was in that town and in that region. And unfortunately, almost after that, most of the um, co uh, colored alliance organizations throughout the South disintegrated by within two years after that. They were all pretty much gone, um, even though people were already underground and stuff. So that's one really horrendous example. That's actual killings, et cetera. Um, there's so many stories about uh, white banks not giving lines of credit, loans um, to black co-ops that I can't even, I wouldn't even start to tell the story. But the really sad part about that story is it wasn't just white commercial banks, it was also federal loan agencies. And we do have, for the black farmers in general, not just the co-ops, there was a lawsuit, and we technically won the lawsuit um, a couple of years ago, but uh, that's the Pigford case, Pigford one and two, but unfortunately, uh, it never reached all the people that were, um, were denied loans. So the problem with the federal agencies were they either denied black farmers or black landowners or black co-ops loans, or they gave them loans at such unfair uh, interest rates and terms that they foreclosed on them within a year or two. And so there's the history has been backed up in those court cases. The best and final example of that, which is actually now a victory, is the New Communities Co-op in Georgia, which started in the 60s or 70s? Early 70s. They actually had 6,000 acres of land owned as a co-op. Um, between the banks and the federal government not giving them loans and then two bad drought years and then sabotage, they like poured sugar in their oil cans and things like that. They were finally foreclosed on, went under, but they were part of the Pigford suit. They sued and they actually got $12 million and were able to buy, uh, two th I think it's now 2,000 acres. So it's not as big as the 6,000 acres, but they were actually able, and so New Communities is back on the rise. So that's a good ending, but most of the endings were not that. I think that's good enough examples. Wow. yeah. Go ahead. I want to, am I on? Yeah. I want to say one of the ironies of that is they ended up buying one of the larger plantation um, sites in <laughs> southeast Georgia. So now the children of the enslaved are living in a big house and um, they're not serving tables in there. Um, you know, this, this whole issue of, you know, what would you want to talk to people about and have them understand before you talk about uh, legitimate demands for reparations, um, it's really important to kind of get a conception not only of the institution of what the enslavement of humans was, but also the perception that they had of it. And in that regard, I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, a document that was printed in the newspaper in New York in February of 1865. Were any of you all reading the, no, probably not. <laughs> um, it's an account of a meeting that had taken place in January 
of 1865 in Savannah, Georgia, where uh, Tecumseh Sherman, who had just done his incredible march through the sea, and uh, so sad what happened to some of those towns. Um, he met with 20 African American leaders to talk to them about what their concerns were and their understanding of slavery and freedom. And this, again, 1865, so the, the, I don't even believe that the war was finally quite over yet, but it was near its end. And uh, so a, a question is asked, and there was a, somebody there recording that actually took what he claims to be verbatim notes of the meeting. So the second question that was asked was, state what you understand by slavery and the freedom that was given um, by the President's proclamation, talking about the Emancipation Proclamation. And the answer that came from one of the ministers representing the group was, slavery is receiving, uh, slavery is receiving by irresistible power the work of another man and not by his consent. And excuse the gendered language, but that was how people talked in 1865. The freedom as I understand it promised by the proclamation is taking us from under the yoke of bondage and placing us where we could reap the fruit of our own labor, take care of ourselves, and assist the government in maintaining our freedom. Um, and they then ask, um, in what manner do you think you could take care of yourselves and how can you best assist the government in maintaining your freedom? The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor, that is by the labor of the women and children and old men, and we can see and we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. Uh, and to assist the government, the young men should enlist in the service of the government and do the military stuff and kill some more uh, Confederates. Um, that wasn't exactly what he said. Um, but this whole idea that people recognized that their enslavement had been the fact that other people took from them the product of their labor and that freedom was to be able to retain for yourself the product of your own labor and keep the surplus, that which goes over and above what it requires to maintain you in the community, to keep that surplus for the uplift of yourself in that community. What a profound understanding that it, it wasn't that freedom is that we're going to be able to get more grants. It wasn't that freedom is that you know we'll all be able to be happy and dance more often and have bigger parties. But freedom was to be able to retain our own production because we are productive people and we produce enough for ourselves. And we, if we were free, we could keep that which we produce for ourselves, take care of our families, take care of our communities, and go on to lead full lives. That profound understanding existed in 1865, and his, the, the, the call for land became part of the basis of uh, Sherman issuing shortly after that, I think it was General Order Number 15, which talked about the 40 acres, didn't mention a mule. The Army had a lot of extra mules, so that was thrown in as an afterthought and became part of the documentation of some of the um, uh, Fre Freedmen's Bureau uh, documents that kind of codified this. All of this was abandoned <laughs> shortly afterward. The federal government uh, retreated from the promises that were made uh, at that point. But the clarity that people had about wanting to do something for themselves and the fact that they knew that this had been stripped away. And so what I really want people to understand before we talk about reparations is that there was a long period of time, and perhaps it continues to this day, where a substantial part of the fruit of people's labor is taken away and held by somebody else and not allowed to be used for their own dignified development of themselves and their communities. And it is for this reason that I think we then enter into a discussion about what would reparations look like. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add to that too that I think one of the things that also complicates all of this conversation is something that we've been talking about within Aorta, which is like what is the state's relationship to the black body? You know, that like um, we were, we had a call about this a few months ago. We were like, yeah, so black lives is, have always mattered in this country, but what is the way in which they mattered, right? That we have to look back on that history of enslavement and recognize that it's not just that the black body was property and that then the state was benefiting from the production of people's bodies, 
but that it was also a commodity, right? That like our bodies were commodities and resources of the state and our reproduction, the reproduction of black community is a commodity from the perspective of the state. And we could see a thread of continuity from that period until now. And so there's this other piece around um, being able to, to have a conversation that's grounded in the reality that from the perspective of the state, the black community is still considered a resource that the state is taking advantage of, <laughs> right? The state is still using our reproduction, the state is still using our production, and the state is still finding ways to, ins right, thank you. The prison industrial complex is a perfect example of this, right? That our labor is still being enslaved and used in these other ways. And so, But not just labor, they, um, right? Like that we are still, when black bodies become a commodity, mm -hmm. right, the state, and I'm not talking about private prisons, I'm talking about public prisons which drive the prison industrial complex, that we become commodities, that states make money from black bodies once they are incarcerated. Right. Oh. Well, and just the only other thing I was just gonna add to that, I think that it just, it does add this additional layer of how, I, th I think we're still finding ourselves in the complication of how do we actually tell this story. Ed, I think you were saying this beautiful thing yesterday in your keynote of we can't even talk about American history, we can't even tell the history to our children because it is so brutal, right? And so when we talk about like how do we set people up well for a conversation about reparations, <laughs> it's sort of like, yeah, how do we ground into the reality that that layer is also, that when we're talking about reparations, we're not talking about reparations for past harm. We are talking about that, and we're talking about an ongoing reality of harm and trauma and theft. I, I would like to politely Pushed a little against this question of change of, of creating the discussion around um, the commodification of the black body. I'm talking about the commodification of black people, who include bodies, souls, spirits, minds, and much more than that. I, I don't want to reduce that to the question of the body having been trapped, because they tried to capture our spirits. They had a very difficult time doing that. But more than that, black creativity was also owned by somebody else and utilized for the purpose of somebody else's profit. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. black, black spirituality was essentially owned by somebody else and attempted to be utilized. Yeah. So yes, things happened to the bodies and bodies had chains on them, but more than that, the whole community's being as whole people and, and I, I hate to refer to whole people by their bodies. <laughs> I, I just, and, sure. and I'm concerned sure. that a lot of the Word. rhetoric of recent years has done that. It's been talking about the black body, the black body. No, 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 I'm talking about the black people, whole, complete human people that yeah. include bodies but have minds. Because quite frankly, it was the black mind which was the greatest challenge to, to, to enslavement. Because a black mind and a black mouth running his mouth could reduce the value of your property. Think of the value of your capitalized property in human as the capitalized value of their output in the terms of the amount of cotton they pick, right? And then somebody stands up and saying, they working us too damn hard. Why in the world, this, they working, <laughs> you can't say they working us like slaves. That wouldn't have made any sense, would it? <laughs> but they working us too, this doesn't make any sense. Nobody, nothing, humans shouldn't have to pick cotton like this and, and cut our knuckles all up and try not to bleed on the cotton. Uh, and, and 200 pounds, that's crazy. Let's only work about half that hard. They would kill him, you know why? As expensive and valuable as an enslaved person was, and I'm talking about a single slave had a cost value, roughly the cost of buying a house. All right, that's how expensive they were. But yeah, kill him because he just destroyed half the value of a hundred more like him by convincing them not to work so hard. Get him to shut up, and so the, the black idea, the black voice, was also a danger to these institutions. So I, I just am concerned yeah. when this is reduced to bodies. And the black imagination. Okay, so um, I wanna push us to the juicy question, um, which is reparations itself. Um, and I think in framing that, um, right, when we talk about, especially when we talk about cooperatives, that 
there, it's important that we understand that capitalism uh, and the regimes, the racial regimes and the economic regimes have shifted so much um, since 40 Acres, right? Like that that was appropriate to the, the political economic context at the time. So now when we talk about reparations, my question to you is what does that look like and how does that get recontextualized, understanding that capitalism is what dispossessed us of our wealth, our ideas, our spirits, our land, our family, our community in the first place. And so when we talk about reparations now, that it must be an anti-capitalist political project inherently. And so we're not talking about cutting checks to people as we started broaching that subject yesterday. Um, so what does that look like um, from the perspective of, of each of you? Um, for me, because my orientation is uh, like a lot of the work, uh, the, the organizing work that I've been doing over the last decade in particular has been around healing justice. Um, my, so my orientation is really thinking about healing from trauma. And so for me, um, I do think a lot about economic reparations for sure and redistribution of wealth and a significant part of how I, at the same time, a significant part of how I think about it is what would it look like for our community to be able to um, claim the space of our own healing to be responsible for our own healing, to be able to really recover our cultural traditions in ways that um, that give us the responsibility of healing ourselves. Um, I think that that's already happening. Like I don't, I'm not saying that as something that's not happening. I'm saying that we that one of the things that would need to be alleviated is um, the pressure of engagement in sort of the medical the medical industrial complex in relationship to what, what health and healing is supposed to look like in our community. It's another one of the ways in which we find ourselves very, um, there's enormous amount of oppression and pressure to be healthy in a specific way and for healthiness to be expressed in a specific way. And so for me, that there's something about having community control of health and wellness. Um, and healing practices that feels like a significant part of reparations that maybe is like the, the, it's the thing that we don't often talk about in that right. context. Right. I mean, it also seems like there's something that needs to be communal and cooperative, right? That part of being, ha having an anti-capitalist politics implicit in contemporary reparations in the proposition for it is that we're not talking about individuals. We're not talking about like, give us your SSN and we'll find a way to cut you a check from the government or something. We're talking about building community institutions, right? Like that a capitalist framework is one that divides and slices and that we all become individuals. And as Ed um, rightly said yesterday, consumers, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, who's next? Um, I'll go next. So I've been arguing from that co-op sabotage perspective that the co-op sabotage gives us another reason and the continuing sabotage, so it's not just past but current sabotages, um, give us a reason for why we need more control over public money. And what should that public money go to? Well, I argue it should go to co-op education, co-op business development, and co-op loan funds. Um, and so uh, I actually just wrote an article for the Journal of Negro History that I, sorry, Journal of African American History, it used to be called the Journal of Negro <laughs> History, <laughs> Journal of African American History that's I think coming out next <laughs> year. Right, we used to be called Negroes. <laughs> oh, by the way, we used to be called Negroes. <laughs> <laughs> among, among other things, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's coming out next year. Anyway, in that I argue, I give some of this history, I give some examples of the sabotage, and then I suggest that what reparation should look like is uh, dedicated public money, so local, state, federal money toward co-op education programs, co-op business development, and loan non-extractive loan funds, which Ted, uh, which Ed will probably talk more about, um, and that we need that combination, and that it's not about again, right, assigning even individual blame or any of that stuff. It's a sy systemic analysis of 
the different ways that assets have been stripped from a group mm -hmm. of people and that we need to return the capacity to develop those assets in our own way and to control our own community and economic development. Um, and so, I don't know, I think it's a pretty good argument. <laughs> I don't know if it'll get anywhere. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say is there is a little bit, there's one trouble spot about talking about public money, right? Which is that right now public money is also all our tax dollars, mm -hmm. right? We have a pr new president who doesn't pay taxes, <laughs> um, but the rest of us pay taxes, right? So a lot of that public money, we're actually just paying it back to ourselves. So there is an right. issue about where else the money should come from. And so I do, I don't think I put it in that article, hmm. but I do have a notion that we also should go back to um, the Black Manifesto. I mean, corporations, religious institutions that have been exploitative, right. we, they right. all need to pay up. Sure. And I'm sorry, yeah. I don't know exactly how much percentage of their revenues, but they need to pay up, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. I am sorry. <laughs> yeah, just flip the thing. Try, try to turn it off and then on. In the, in the meantime, I was going to just no, add the no, universities. No? no? <laughs> that the universities that we built no, should probably give people, yeah, okay. well, black people, scholarships. I had a <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, jo and Georgetown. They were established with slave trade money. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just... I really wanted to, um, the qu a couple of questions. So part of what we're talking about is who owes reparations and where should it go if, if, it, if it comes? And I really want to think of this in the, the framework of, of commons and rebuilding a commons because again, I think that much of what is wrong in the world is that somebody has somewhat arbitrarily and greedily appropriated both nature and again, all of the surplus that everybody has produced from labor so I've seen people talk about reparation from the standpoint of lost wages. I believe that wage slaves should, should try to get some, wage slaves who were paid a wage should try to get reparation for the fact that the value of their production was taken. That's what the guy was talking about. He wasn't talking about, you know, they didn't pay us wages. He said that they took, they appropriated the value of that which we produced. That's way more than the wages. So all of these calculations you see based on lost wages, I don't know what the minimum wage was in 1790 anyway, so I'm not <laughs> quite sure what the wages would have been. But in any case, we're talking about the value of production. Yeah, compound, that could be a lot of money. But the whole, the whole nation and the Western world is built off of the surplus produced largely and rooted in the slave trade. It was produced over a period uh, of, of, of 100 years and the, the Industrial Revolution. So the people who have benefited from this are all of the folk who got a whole bunch of money right now. So there's all of the foundations, all of the big churches, all of the, the, the wealthy individuals, and some of them say, no, I, I got this by my own hard work, and I want to tell them that you got to sit down and gamble at a table loaded with our stolen money. And you might have been a good gambler, and you might have won at that table, but do not assume that your winnings would have meant anything had you not been playing at a table loaded down with our stolen money. So you all owe this reparation back into the commons so that we can all fully develop our, our, our human capacity. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> but I know uh, we don't so have much time. It's true. Um, and you've already answered what my last question was. Um, this is like 30 second answers from each of you. H what is the role of a politics of collective liberation in thinking through the prospect of, uh, of reparations? Just for the two of you, because Ed just answered it. Oh, well, we what is it? Um, <laughs> I think the role of the uh, politics of collective liberation, and we were talking about this a little bit, I think, in yesterday's workshop, but is uh, real, we have to have a deep belief that liberation is possible. That is the role of our politics of collective liberation. We need to believe it's possible. We need to know that it actually is possible because we do know historically that we have self-organized differently and we know that it is inevitably, inevitable that we will self-organize differently in the future. So if we can stand in that sort of, I think of it as just sort of seeing our generational, the generational nature of change, 
then we can step deeply into that belief that it is possible and work from that place as opposed to working from a place of, I believe imagination is important, but this can't just be our imagination at this point. We need to be able to um, visualize and believe in and then act on um, the notion of the commons, as Ed would say, or I actually wrote something where I called it um, cooperative solidarity uh, commonwealth. And by that, I mean a system where we all have interlocking co-ops of different kinds in, in a solidarity economy because that's where we can, to me, that's the, if it's not the end stage, it's at least the first stage of gaining back that commons and that common way of living and, and being and stuff. And I think part of our problem is the miseducation, right? That we don't yet see that that's possible or viable, right? We've been brainwashed that nothing but capitalism will produce the kind of life we think we want and we'll do this and that. So we have to unbrainwash we have to understand that that vision of having a, a, a cooperative society that produces and uh, redistributes and gives power to all of us, that that's possible and that we can be a piece of it. We don't have to solve all of it because we can all do pieces of it and make that commonwealth happen. Um, and I just want to end my 30 seconds on my rant against kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> I promised Ed he could hear it, and so I'm going to use it here for my last 30 seconds. I believe that kindergarten is one of the problems, one of our barriers, because kindergarten is actually part of the capitalist miseducation that we have. If you think about what happens to kindergarten, either for yourself or if you're a parent, we take fabulously creative, spiritual, innovative, active children and we put them in kindergarten. And what's kindergarten's three missions? Socialization. What does socialization mean? They learn to sit in their seat with their hands on their side and listen to a teacher, right? Second, we learn, they te learn individualism, which is that their solutions are only in themselves and they're not supposed to either cohort with anybody else or share any ideas or, um, in fact, it's cheating. By the time you get to first grade, it's cheating to confer, to confer with a fellow classmate about an answer, right? And then, I forgot what the third one is, but you get the idea of where I'm going. <laughs> so basically, by the end of kindergarten, if they've successfully made it, they have become little individualist, capitalist, um, private venture, whatever, and they've learned that cooperation is like the worst possible thing you can do. In fact, you get into big trouble if you do it, and that if they want to succeed in this world, they've got to purge all that out of them. And if they don't learn that in kindergarten, they fail and they have to repeat it. And we parents, we, we, we're collusive. We're in, what's the word? <laughs> now I'm getting up, upset about it. But we collude, right? We collude with them because we say, yeah, oh my God, my child doesn't know how to sit quietly and regurgitate what the teacher said when they're allowed to talk. You know, right? That's something wrong with my kid. And then we let them do it even worse. So to me, it starts with that. We've got to reform kindergarten and then keep reforming the rest from there because if we can really get our children involved in this whole cooperative commonwealth then that's real our, our, that's our gen that's our solution okay uh, and just very <laughs> I like that I'm gonna get a hat down with kindergarten <laughs> abolish kindergarten. you know <laughs> make America <laughs> get rid of kindergartens um, <laughs> but in addition to that, I also want to support going after low-hanging fruit, yeah. which is to say there are people with wealth in this country who, if you talk to them about it, can come to understand that it's really not there. They want it gambling at this table loaded down with other people's stolen money. And some young people with wealth in this country have actually been willing to put that money back into the commons. Yeah. And that's part of how the Southern Reparations Loan Fund mm -hmm. exists. That's part of our early funding for it. We will continue to look for and seek other ways of getting some of the other stolen money that's, that's out there. But right now there's low-hanging fruit and we're putting it into a loan fund rather than into a grant pool mm -hmm. because we're not trying to get people to consume it. We're trying to get people to use it, be productive, and put back and make the commons better than they found it so that the succeeding generations will also have this to draw from utilize, be productive, and put more back in. And this is a cycle I think can be developed and built when you retain the value of your own 
production. And uh, so we're going after the low hanging fruit first. And then we'll figure out some point later on how to come up with the torches and pitchforks and get the rest of it. Thank you, Ed. I, I want you all to shower this panel with all of your love, these beautiful people. You're beautiful, smart, and I love you. And that goes for you, too. You're also beautiful and smart, and I love you. Um, thanks, I, thanks Esteban, also, for a great facilitation. Oh, you are welcome.